Good afternoon. My name is Amy McCreeth. I'm the coordinator of Technology and Culture Forum at MIT and the Episcopal Chaplain at MIT. And it's my good fortune to welcome all of you to this forum this afternoon here in the Bartos Theater at MIT. It's been our good fortune at Technology and Culture Forum to co-sponsor this two-part series on the campaign and the media with the Communications Forum at MIT and with the Center for the Future Civic Media. And I'm very thankful for the great work that the staff at both, both places have put into putting this series together. As many of you know, this is the second of a two-part series. And we first gathered here to discuss the campaign in the media at the end of September with another wonderful panel. And at that time, we had a tremendous discussion about a lot of aspects of this issue. Some of the things that stood out for me in, in that discussion, which will probably continue as themes tonight, are first of all, what media are breaking stories around the campaign? And how much of the news about the elections that we see in the media is actual reportage and how much is simply talk or commentary on the facts? And does it matter? Does it matter whether the media are breaking stories and how that happens? Do people really care about the facts when they go to the polls? Or is their vote based on something else? We also talked at that first forum about Obama's campaign uh, and its very savvy tactics using new media and whether that was going to make a difference, especially in terms of getting out the vote among younger voters and what the long-term implications of those techniques and that strategy would be. And finally, we talked about whether or not and the extent to which new media are having a significant impact on election politics and on the election process. So tonight, we're on the other side of the election, and I'm glad about that. I don't know about you. Uh, it was quite, quite a fall, and um, I'm glad it's resolved now, and we are um, standing on the other side of it and able to look back on the events of uh, Election Day and see um, from our perspective now uh, how the campaign and the media came together. So tonight, we have a tremendous panel to guide us in this, this discussion. Um, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about each of the people up front. Uh, we have Ian Rowe, who's the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Public Affairs for MTV. Ian oversees MTV's on-air, online, and off-air pro-social campaigns, known as Think TV. And his work includes the 2008 Choose or Lose campaign. Uh, he's been referred to as the conscience of, M of MTV. <laughs> you can tell us whether that's true or not. Uh, prior to MTV, he worked with the USA Freedom Corps at the White House, uh, the President's Initiative on Volunteer Service. So welcome, Ian Rowe, to MIT. Uh, sitting next to Ian, we have Mark Ambinder, an associate editor at The Atlantic and a contributing editor to both The Hotline and National Journal. Uh, Mark was the editor of Hotline on Call, a path-breaking political news blog, and he was one of the founders of ABC's The Note. His latest writings can be found on the Mark Ambinder blog, which you may be familiar with. So welcome, Mark Ambinder to MIT. And next to Mark is Cyrus Crone, the director of the Republican National Committee's e-campaign. Uh, Cyrus was formerly the publisher and co-founder of Slate Magazine, and prior to joining Microsoft, he, was, he produced programs for CNN, including Larry King Live and Crossfire. So welcome to you as well. Welcome, Cyrus. <laughs> Moderating the discussion tonight is Henry Jenkins. Uh, Henry Jenkins is the co-director of the Comparative Media Studies program at MIT and the Peter de Florens Professor of Humanities at MIT. He's the author of Convergence Culture, Where Old and New Media Collide, and many other great books on media and popular culture. So tonight, uh, Henry will moderate our discussion, and we're going to go, um, I think, until 7 o'clock. If, um, if folks have lots of questions, there'll be time after, after the discussion up front. There'll be lots of time for all of you to ask questions and make comments. So when we get to that point, there'll be 
microphones in the aisles, and uh, Professor Jenkins will invite you forward to, uh, to offer your thoughts and your questions to this great panel. So with that, we'll turn it over to Henry Jenkins. Thank you very much. Happy, happy to see everyone out there today. Uh, you know, I, ever since I came to MIT 20 years ago, we've been organizing these forums on democracy and new media through the communication forum event. And every year going into the election cycle, I, we hear pundits say, this is going to be the one. This is the one that digital media is going to transform American society. This is the one where power of old media gives way to the power of new media. And then the election ends, whatever dramatic, spectacular events take place, and the pundits then say, oops, I guess we were wrong. New media didn't make that much difference anyway. It really was old media and its agendas that set the tone for this campaign. Now, mind you, these are pundits speaking through old media, for the most part, who've decided that new media didn't matter terribly much. Uh, but it's been a repeated cycle. And I, my own theory has been that they really are looking for the, the digital equivalent of the Kennedy-Nixon debate. The problem is the Kennedy-Nixon debate is an archetypical example of broadcast media. Its power was people all over the country watching the same event at the same moment in time, rather than the dispersed, decentralized, social networking effects that are associated with new media as it has its impact. New media is never going to be felt in that concentrated way that uh, something like the Kennedy-Nixon debate represented. What I hope we can do today, though, is to dig deeper into the myth and reality of the role of new media in this last election cycle, to sort of see how, what these three experts have to say about uh, the role that new media played, and to see if we can come up or at least agree on some criteria that would help us to think more deeply about the role of new media. As I do it, I think we have to dispel the myth that it's about simply new media, and that it really is very much about the relationship of old and new media. That, we, that one has to think about as, as we go forward. So what I want to do is begin by having each of the people in the panel sort of introduce, as way of introduction, just tell us what you've been up to for the last 12 months. Uh, <laughs> you've been out there dealing with the, the thick of this thing from different vantage points. So why don't you just give as a, tell us a little about yourself and what you've been doing. So Ian, why don't you start us off? Uh, just a, a piece of information our research folks sent us, I think, is so um, uh, illustrative of what we've been through. So we have a group of 18 to 22-year-olds all across the country. It's sort of our private audience community. They were constantly asking them about a whole range of issues. And of course, related to the election, we asked them, so tell us three brands that really you associate with Obama versus McCain, you know, just to get a sense of, you know, how young people are positioning these two. And with Obama, the three brands were Apple, innovative, um, you know, Nike, excellent, and Coca-Cola, somewhat sturdy, you know, all sort of top tier brands. With John McCain, the brands were Exxon Mobil, <laughs> um, Tommy Hilfiger, and Ben, and ben Gay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that's a, it's funny, but it's so illustrative of how our audience, I think, absorbed um, both of these both of these candidates. Um, um, as folks said, you know, I, I have the job at MTV, which is all about how to figure out how to use the power of our brand to engage young people on some of the the biggest issues facing their generation. So we've done a lot of work around issues like HIV, uh, global poverty, discrimination, um, uh, global warming, uh, but we clearly um, discovered way back in 1992 that the political process, particularly presidential politics, was a mystery to most young people um, in that they rarely felt that presidential candidates were speaking to them about the issues that really uh, mattered to them, were speaking to them in a language that they could understand. Um, presidential candidates assumed young people weren't going to vote. There's just this terrible cycle. And so we decided to step in back in 1992 to create a campaign called Choose or Lose which solely existed for the purpose of mobilizing young people to understand the issues, to register, to vote, and really get candidates to speak to 18 to 29 year olds. And so 1992, 1996, 2000, 2004. So it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a business we've been in now for some time. And while 
everyone, I think, really was looking, like this year, Obama, the phenomenon, you know, we've been seeing an incredible upward swing uh, since 2004, that young people have just been coming out in big, big numbers. In 2004, there are almost four million more 18 to 29 year olds that voted than in the year 2000. Um, and then in 2006, in terms of congressional midterm elections, it was the highest turnout in more than two decades. So we were fully anticipating that come 2008, we would see big, big numbers. And again, in the, in the presidential primaries, turnout was double, quadru in, uh, triple, and quadruple in some states. Um, and so we, we, we saw that there was this phenomena uh, occurring. And it's clearly, and, it, and, and it's really been more than 12 months, we started our you know, presidential coverage essentially back in um, February of 2007. There was just, it was just, we had never ever uh, started a presidential campaign. I mean, in fact, usually we start our presidential campaign coverage of Choose or Lose in February of the election year. So we were fully a year before just given the incredible level of interest um, from our audience. Um, and we also obviously had started to see the explosion um, in tools that young people were using in every other aspect of their life. You know, the idea that they could now self-publish and self-organize around what mattered to them, whether it be music or hanging out with their friends, why wouldn't they do that around social issues and presidential politics? And so this whole idea of we were gonna have a national election, but there were a lot of young people that were really interested in local issues, because in many states, many cities, who your local alderman is, mayor, may have a lot more influence over your life um, than necessarily who the president was. And so we saw with all these new technologies, we saw an opportunity to partner with the uh, Knight Foundation around something called their uh, Night News Challenge, um, where we created an idea called Street Team 08, uh, where we had 51 uh, journalists, one from each state and DC, whose sole job it was all year long to report on issues of importance to young people within their given state. Um, and to really you know, use all the technologies, whether it be, and I'll, I'll have a short video that I'll play right now, use mobile technologies, use online, use Twitter. The, the, the basic premise was go to where young people are already. And that we don't care where the media is consumed, but just reach them where they are. And it was just, and again, we'll talk about it more, but it was a phenomenal uh, experience to see these 51 report over the course of the year. Um, and maybe with that note, I'll end, we'll show the video and um, tons more to, Tons more to talk about. So this is the one we'll start. Uh, yes. We all knew this election was going to be different. There was the explosion in the... Oh, shit, I'm sorry. Oh, you could just keep going. Uh, we'll try this again. I'm just trying, we're trying to enlarge... We all knew this election was going to be different. There was the explosion and the turnout at the Iowa caucuses, and a movement among young voters in particular, unlike anything we'd seen before. And of course, some history-making candidates from the get-go. But there was also a new way of covering the election. The technology that had just begun to revolutionize politics in 2004 had gone viral. Reporting, or some version of it, had become decentralized, networked, and more mobile than ever. High definition and formality took a backseat to immediacy and intimacy for the YouTube generation. Street Team 08 was just one such experiment. 51 young amateur news hounds representing every state and the District of Columbia, some with journalism degrees, most not so much, gathered in New York City for a two-day crash course in videography and journalist ethics. And then we were turned loose into the wild. We were to cover national news from a local perspective, and vice versa, and all through the eyes of young voters, from stump speeches in Georgia. I want to tell you something, folks. I've spoken all over this country. I've spoken in Utah, and I don't know if they're pressing the All the way to stump speeches in Washington State. Uh, and I thought that was pretty darn good until I realized that San Jaya, an American Idol, won five million more than me. So. From showing how national issues affect local young voters. $600 travels a lot farther in West Virginia than it would in other states. Therefore, there's a good chance that mountaineers might be more prudent with their cash, somewhat defeating the purpose of this economic stimulus bill. 
I, I would use $600 to pay for rent. To sharing our community stories with the national audience. I think that our vote um, can really count now because a lot of people are really embracing indigenous culture and indigenous ways. People who aren't indigenous, they, they, they look they looking upon our people as, as people who, who've always known. And paying particular attention to one of our most important issues this year, the plight of our young veterans. And it just got worse and I ended up like uh, having a relapse. I ended up actually getting behind the wheel of a, a car, you know, after I'd been drinking, I got into a wreck and I got the boot. That's how I got out. I was a Marine Corps infantry. I served two, two tours in Iraq. As a veteran, I know it was difficult for me when I came out of the military trying to be a civilian again. I had to fight and scrape and, 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 and pander the government to get me the things that I raped. And for the most part, not paying nearly as much attention to Paris Hilton as you might think. Instead of talking about cheap celebrity drama, let's talk about our not so cheap $482 billion projected budget deficit for 2009. A new record, BTW. We also tried to push the edge of the reporting envelope in ways only our technological generation can. On Super Tuesday, we used video enabled cell phones to cover almost every primary state throughout the day, streaming live video from the phones to our website and from there to the cable network. Sure, this is my first time out there and I'm only 23 so this is actually my second time voting in an election. Um, but it's my first time voting in a primary, uh, donating money to a campaign, actually following around South Carolina, traveling all over Georgia to make this. We even got one very elusive future VP candidate on one of our cell phones. Hey, this is a cool day. I mean, talk about involvement by Americans having a say in where this nation's going to go. This is an exciting day. And for Alaska, you know, I hope we register on somebody's radar screen. Yeah, I think they're on our radar now. We did it again for the conventions, although by this time we were hardly alone. In Denver? Um, how did you feel about Hillary's speech tonight? Honestly, I thought it was amazing. I think she did a really great job of bringing together the Democratic Party. Um, no way, no how, no McCain. And Minneapolis on the inside. Oh, tell me about that pin. Uh, I'm sorry if it seems too pointed or extreme, but Obama's a socialist. And it's completely polar opposite from anything our founding fathers would have wanted. And Minneapolis on the outside. They're, they're gassing people. They're gassing people here. Gas is coming down on I'm Trying to get away. Oh, my throat's burning. Oh, my nostrils are burning, too. My eyes are starting to water. Local, national, on the ground, on the web, and mobile. Talking to young voters as young voters where they are. This is politics in 2008. Is it improvement? Don't know yet. But I bet 2012 is going to be crazy. Okay, all right. So, Mark? Just going back to Paris Hilton, I remember the good old days when the budget deficit actually was $480 billion. In fact, the national debt increased by $480 billion or so in October alone. Um, but uh, I have had the privilege of doing journalism in a new media format, um, mostly on, on the blog, for one of the oldest, most established old media brands in the country, namely The Atlantic, uh, which uh, was founded more than 150 years ago as a, as a clarion call uh, to uh, the nation to fight against uh, slavery. In addition to that, I was also a consultant for CBS News, so it really it gave me a good uh, mash of old media and new media perspectives. I just want to tell one very brief story about um, a story that I, th I think illustrates a little bit the moment that we're in. It, it doesn't make me look very good, but um, uh, about a week before the election, uh, John, uh, Barack Obama's national field director, John Carson, sent an email to several thousand Obama supporters who were living in Arizona. And the email said, you know, our internal polling shows that Arizona is a really close race. Uh, we want to try and see if we can uh, increase our field efforts there. We want to get people to volunteer. Um, somebody who received that email forwarded it along to me. I thought it was a fairly, it wasn't, it's not a huge story, but I thought it was a fairly interesting example of what the uh, Obama campaign was doing in the week before the election and, of course, uh, illustrating, um, even if they were faking it, a sense that they thought Arizona was competitive. Um, so I, I 
put the email on my blog, I stripped out what I thought were all the identifying information of the person who received the email. Um, uh, but what I didn't realize is that every email that the Obama campaign sent out included embedded hidden geocoding um, that, uh, so that the, the link, the volunteer link, if you wanted to volunteer, even though it, was, it seemed fairly generic, it was something like barackobama.com slash Arizona, every time you click through that link, uh, it would send a, a message to the Obama campaign central servers showing exactly whose email had been used uh, had been used to facilitate that link. So, of course, in journalism, you never want to reveal your sources. And again, this wasn't something terribly huge. Um, but the, the poor guy who sent me, who, uh, who, who forwarded me the email, uh, suddenly got lots of ribbing and teasing emails from Obama people asking why he had forwarded me, uh, forwarded me the email. Um, so again, it, it's sort of an example of how I think uh, even the practices of modern journalism haven't necessarily caught up with uh, uh, new media technology. So I'm happy to talk about that and, and lots of other things. Well, I stumbled into this election cycle somewhat accidentally. Um, I, I, I spent 10 years at Microsoft and then went to Yahoo and was at Yahoo for two years. And my job with both companies was to help politicians figuring out how to use those companies' products to influence um, elections. Uh, as an example, you know, working with Mitt Romney on a video mashup tool called Jump Cut that Yahoo had acquired, uh, working with campaigns to geocode their Flickr photos and understand how that worked. Um, I spent the bulk of my time helping Senator Obama and Senator Clinton um, think about how to integrate themselves into these networks. And I, I grew up a Republican. I'm an Army brat, traveled around uh, the world from military base to military base. And um, really, with my, my, my core interest is the intersection of technology and uh, politics and how the, how the world is evolving. But never did I think that I'd actually be a part of a campaign. And one day I got a call from a, a friend who used to work at the Republican National Committee and said they need somebody that understands technology. Are you interested? And I reflected on sort of what I was doing at that time, and it was basically spending the majority of it helping Senator Obama and Senator Clinton. And at that point, decided that if I was really going to be in this election, I may as well jump in wholeheartedly and went back to um, my party and moved across country and uh, had a really fascinating experience the last 20 months. So let's jump right into the core issue of the panel. Uh, I like to start with sort of broad first principles. So if we were going to make an argument one way or another about the impact of new media on this election cycle, what are the criteria we would use? What, in what way, not did new media make a difference? I think we can agree it did, but in what ways did it make a difference? Oh, well, I, I'm just going to say one thing that I think you saw right at the beginning of this cycle was a lot of old media platforms using new media technologies and essentially um, adopting the rhetorical styles uh, and, and the style of new media and essentially trying as large conglomerates and corporations do to sort of um, uh, muscle in on the territory of independent new media. So I think you at first have to make a distinction between independent new media and then the, the new media that was generated by the old media. I mean, you had a publication, for example, like the Politico, which um, uh, was uh, or and, and, and is a fascinating example of a, of a, a new medium startup that was, uh, uh, that was originated by an old media corporation uh, in, in Virginia and really made a huge impact and, and broke a lot of stories and so on and so forth. So I think you have to make you have to make that distinction first. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say, you know, sort of brass tacks, I think the number one criteria that you would look at is who voted and how many. You know, um, we have no, uh, there are about 24 million 18 to 29 year olds uh, voted, which again, if you, it was about, again, close to a 4 million person increase from, from 2004. We are strongly, strongly believe that that um, is a big fact, and 70% of those, nearly 70% of those voted for uh, Senator Obama, which was the largest gap 
ever um, between two candidates within our generation. We're convinced that, that has a, a big part of that is his use of new media and and how he used it. I mean, it's it's just extraordinary. You know, it's it, a lot of folks talk about it very bottom up. But it was actually, I, we believe, it, very centralized, but decentralized process. You know, this this idea that everyone had um, sort of part ownership of his brand. It's so interesting, right? Because we, we, you talked earlier about, you know, facts, you know, did people care? You know, one of the things about the internet, not only does it allow greater distribution of information, it allows greater distribution of misinformation. But even that, um, Senator Obama mastered, and probably mo most folks saw this website that they created called fightthesmears.com which we just thought was incredible. I mean, here was a site that was set up for the deliberate purpose of highlighting a lot of the internet rumors that heretofore usually were used to destroy a campaign, and yet it was used as a vehicle to give his supporters a way to be active in the campaign. So, or are you going there? No, I was gonna go there, just keep oh, talking. Yeah, it's talking it. fightthesmears.com, and the power of it is it literally lists in a very uh, user-friendly way all the most terrible uh, rumors about Senator Obama. He's a socialist, he's a terrorist, he wasn't actually born in Hawaii, um, what else, there, <laughs> well. He's a Muslim. He's a Muslim. Um, and the beauty of this was that it highlighted and said, you know what, get the facts. So you could go to this website, learn the truth from the perspective of Senator Obama, but most importantly, on the left-hand side, if you scroll down a little bit, there's a little widget that you could put on your Facebook page or your MySpace page. Help us spread the truth. So, so then you became an ally in Senator Obama to preserve and protect his brand. So every single person had a role to play in his um, campaign, which is this level of thinking. You know, If you go to many of his, his YouTube pages where all his videos were, there you had the ability to actually donate to his campaign. All of these very subtle but incredibly powerful and viral uh, mechanisms to give every single person a way to actually engage. So, so no longer this idea of just being a passive supporter. You could give money, but if you couldn't give money, you could organize local beat-ups. If you go to mybarackobama.com, you can find uh, you know, local initiatives that were happening. And it wasn't that Senator McCain wasn't using these. I think over time, they finally started to adopt these tools, but just the level of precision and thought that had gone before um, with Senator Obama, I just think, set up a foundation that just ultimately was just not, they couldn't uh, cover the gap. Well, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't provide some historical context on the evolution of technology and uh, presidential campaigns. Uh, and if we can hearken back to the 2004 election, um, GOP team leader, which was uh, the first development in, in trying to create a social network and environment to congregate um, the electorate was really, I, I think if you go back and look, the, the first true example that the Obama campaign um, revved on. Um, so I think the, the media cycle didn't really discounted um, the background that the party had. And you know, so this was the, the Bush-Cheney team that had developed this. Um, the, the McCain campaign um, had a, a much different version and they basically developed brand new code um, instead of building on top of uh, GOP team leader. But I'm not sure, well, at least from, from my vantage point, we won't know the true impact of the election for our party moving forward until about another 45 days from now. And that's because we've been doing some database work to analyze the impact of the internet to turn out the vote and try to determine if that was the so sole mechanism for influencing uh, voters' decisions, and it's very difficult to create a control group where the internet's the sole determinant because you're being barraged by so many different media types. The closest example we were able to get to that was in Louisiana during Bobby Jindal's gubernatorial race where we had taken our database. I should just back up a little bit and give you some context on our database voter vault. Um, we, we have a voter file of you know, every voter in the country. Um, if um, Im, 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 embedding tracking code and emails um, 
you know, scares you, knowing how much information we have in our database about voter behavior in terms of um, purchasing habits, decision making, magazines that you uh, subscribe to, cars that you've purchased, et cetera. We can build a pretty complex profile of, of voters. And um, there's a company called Catalyst on the left who's doing this. They hired the um, they hired the CTO of Amazon to develop their database. And I'm not quite sure that they're at parity with the Republicans yet in their database technology. But the long and the short of it is we, we, we took our database and we overlaid it on top of major publishers' databases and were able to identify voters nationwide by party affiliation and flag those individuals so that we could then target succinct messages to them um, at the household level. And in the Jindal campaign, we served um, all sorts of different online media types to voters, capturing uh, their PII data, and then after the election, went and analyzed the Secretary of State's roles and determined that of, of, of the voters who clicked on one of our banner ads uh, and gave us their information, 76% of them voted, compared to 48% statewide turnout. So the delta there is significant um, in, in terms of what we were able to understand about the internet. What we don't know yet is at, at the nationwide level how that same strategy impacted voters going to the polls. And I, I guess I'll be able to answer that question more thoroughly um, in, in a month and sure. a half. But you can sign up. Um, I, I see you with some of you with computers. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, wherever. Just let's link up and I'll give you the results. So what you're basically saying is Barack Obama would have won even more had it not been for voter vaults technology. <laughs> wow. Something well, like that. I, I want it, but no, but I, I actually want to, I want to bring that back because we are all technological um, fetishists here, but, but we should go back to first principles, which is that um, uh, the Bush campaign in 2004 uh, and the Obama campaign in 2008, um, I think were successful in part because they both managed to use um, uh, tried and tested old media marketing techniques and merged them with with technology. Um, you know, one of the and one of the simplest insights of persuasion or research on persuasion is simply that people are more likely to respond to people who look like them, have lifestyles like them. So, um, the uh, uh, Bush campaign in 2004 organized its volunteer canvassing around what they called affinity groups. Uh, people in certain areas who own guns would uh, would would make can would canvas. They'd go to make door knocks, or they'd telephone, or they'd send mail either directly or via email to people who also own guns in the same area. Uh, the Democrats in 2004 just did not have the capacity to do that. Well, the Obama campaign, with 630 million dollars um, and very rapid technological advancement, I mean this, the. Uh, you know, uh, the, the period that, uh, and it'd be interesting to see whether Democrats did catch up to Republicans um, because both sides sort of keep their, keep their cards as close to the vest as possible, even after the election, so you're not quite sure. But what the Obama campaign was able to do is marry the te technology, the economies of scale, and, and modern marketing techniques. So they had, and, and they brag about an email database of, um, of just the Obama campaign alone, of, of 10 million people. About 4 million of those people are actually just email addresses and zip codes. And the dirty little secret is that the Obama campaign was only able to figure out 85% 80, of, of who those people are, so they don't know who, so, um, because it's not the easiest thing in the world to marry somebody's email to their identity. Um, so that leaves uh, 6 million people uh, left. Um, about 3 million of them were contributors. Uh, about two million of them were active volunteers. That means they actually did things through the variety of Barack Obama websites. And on election day, they had a million people using their technologies, um, uh, which, which again is again something to think about the economy of scale. And they just had the money and the technological resources to uh, um, to do that. But they absolutely did build on what the Republican the Republican uh, effort was. Uh, in, in 2004. And just to give one concrete example about it, you had a, a place like Warren, Michigan, which is the birthplace of the, uh, the, uh, the Reagan Democrat. It's where Democratic pollster Stanley Greenberg famously did his polling uh, and sort of limbed out this group of people called Reagan Democrats. Traditionally, uh, Democrats weren't able to figure out how to send, um, for example, if, if the target was a 53-year-old mother of two, 
the Democrats didn't have the resources to send to that person's home or, or have the person making the telephone call, you know, a mother of two who was in her 50s. This cycle, they could do that. Um, and again, uh, this is an insight that Republicans had earlier than the Democrats, and they had the resources to, to uh, put, put it into reality. And, and this cycle, the Obama campaign had those resources, and that's, I think, part of the, uh, part of, part of the reason, um, I, think, I think that's part of, the, part of the answer to the question. I mean, there's so many different parts, but I think that's part of it. Um, just one more no, point on that. I, I think one of the other interesting things that's happened since really Howard Dean's use of technology is data ownership and really controlling that. I mean, when you look at meetup.com and the fact that all of that data w was third party owned, now with APIs, et cetera, um, the ability to d d distribute via widgets, et cetera, and, and then collect and disseminate and um, parse that information makes it so much more powerful. Right, both, uh, both parties used, for example, Facebook applications to um, you could very easy on Facebook if you wanted to make phone calls on behalf of John McCain or I think the I think the McCain campaign did this you can yeah. tell me if they did Barack Obama you could just within five or six minutes you would get a list of people who you could start calling again the 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 efficiency of that sort of get out the voter or I should not get out the vote but persuasion tech is something that this country has really uh, ha has really never seen well what was going on behind the scenes in the social networks um, I think far outweighed the value of the actual interaction on the networks themselves. As an example, y y you've probably heard of a company um, in Southern California called Rapleaf, a uh, social network data mining organization. And the fact that we could send them information from our voter file and then they would spit back um, a, a spreadsheet with the individuals um, who matched that were on, had a public profile on a social network, but then the ability to extend that out into that individual's group of friends that had public profiles on networks um, for targeting purposes was um, just a gold mine. I mean, it was unbelievable what you could actually get to communicate with. Um, and Do you then, actually know what magazines I subscribe to? I mean, if you log into Voter Vault, you could see that I subscribe to X, Y, and Z. Well, that would come from the, the point I was just making was really more about the social network. Right, but I'm just sphere. saying, just the, the, the ability to find. I mean, the, the, um, the, the just the, I guess, the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of it, but the fact that you're able to figure out precisely who someone is and who they, who they hang around with, who they're likely to hang around with, who they're likely to influence. From multiple sources, whether you're mining from right. social networks or acquiring data through um, data resellers, um, and, and this isn't unique to the Republican oh, Party. Oh, no, no, and, the Democrats um, had it through Catalyst. But does that exactly. raise a privacy issue? Um, I, we live in such an interesting world right now. Yeah. Um, I, you know, people thought Microsoft was bad, and now we're seeing what Google Earth can achieve. Um, <laughs> I don't know where the privacy lines are anymore. Yeah, that's good. All right, well, let's, coming at this question from another angle, uh, which constituencies were, were influenced most directly by new media? Clearly, much of the media story has been about young voters, but I suspect there are also other constituencies that, you, that new media tactics have been, enga have been engaging with. Apart from mapping all voters, are there specific right. things for specific groups that we can point to in this cycle? Um, yeah, a couple examples. Um, well, I, and, and one thing I think we should certainly stress is that you know, new media technology um, strengthened a candidate who had a phenomenal and consistent message. I, I think sometimes we give too much credit to the technology and, you know, there's, there's an overall strategy that exists and then you figure out the best tools to, to, you know, to really deploy to engage your audience. And so, for example, you know, um, in the case of one example with Obama, this whole idea of a new kind of governance, new kind of government, a new kind of way of listening um, to your audience. So there was some, some particular legislation, I think it was FISA uh, legislation, speaking of privacy issues, that over the course of the, the early part of the campaign, he had, a, per, he had a, uh, a position that pretty much allied with a more left um, position, was anti-Bush, but after he won the nomination, he basically took a different position on this particular piece of legislation. And there was a revolt on MyBarackObama.com. Literally thousands and thousands of his supporters created a group 
complaining and saying he'd, he'd been a traitor, he'd, you know, now you've won the nomination, you've gone back on your word, and to the point where he had to go on to this particular group and started blogging to give his rationale as to why he had changed his particular position on this piece of legislation. So this was a particular constituency, very concerned around privacy issues, had been in his camp, but really thought, you know what, maybe we, we should, because uh, at that time there were still some issues around Hillary Clinton and maybe she wouldn't pull out. Um, but I think it sent a huge message that he basically said, look, you're, we're gonna have to agree to disagree on this one, but here's why I've changed my position. And I think that message, um, and again, both candidates could have used this technology, it's no big deal to create now a, a, a community space, but he used it in a whole new way to actually acknowledge a constituency that was very important to him and had a lot of influence over other constituencies. Um, but again, his use of the technology, I thought, reinforced his overall message that this is a new kind of governance, a new kind of way to bring you into the political process and how I, as a candidate and ultimately as a president, and I really hope we, we do get to the, the point to talk about how do we think all of this affects how he's gonna govern um, as president. But again, the technology sometimes is given too much credit, how it fits into an overall strategy and how it reinforces the message um, that he sent. I think that's a, that's a great example of how a, a particular constituency, I think, was strengthened at a point where it really could have gone south for Senator Obama. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, technology is a commodity, and it's the cachet and persona of the candidate that's going to drive the use of it. Um, uh, I was... I was daunted by the amount of user-generated content that was generated in support of Obama, uh, and you know you can rattle them off whether it was Will I Am or Obama Girl or so on, so on, so on. And you know the one piece of the one piece of media that generated the, the most buzz around the McCain campaign um, were the McCain girls, and that was actually something done by um, the Huffington Post. That it took a couple of days, I think, for people to figure out that it, it was a, it was a parody. So, um, you know, it, I think that had a lot to do with just the psyche of the youth um, attraction, because this is where they're consuming their their media, um, and had such a presence there. I want to talk a little bit about the Obama campaign's uh, efforts in the African American community using both old media and new media at various points. Um, in South Carolina, the campaign noticed that there was a, a resistance among older Afri African American women uh, to Obama's candidacy. This was before, I should say, Obama won, uh, won Iowa. Um, uh, and that ch changed a lot, of, a lot of things. But there was a resistance, and a lot of the resistance was centered around the idea um, that, uh, that he couldn't win. Uh, and that the historical moment just, it, it just, you know, African Americans had at times been so close to the dream and it had always been taken away from them. So the Obama campaign, um, uh, Mich Michelle Obama had done several very successful speeches speaking directly to this subject. And in order to reach uh, older African American women in South Carolina, the Obama campaign created VHS cassette tapes and CDs. Um, and they went uh, to what they called the B&B &B circuit, which is the barbershop and beauty, uh, beauty salon circuit. Uh, and literally, they would have volunteers go into barbershops and beauty salons with, with, with DVD players or, or miniature televisions, and they'd play the speech from, uh, from Michelle Obama. And they credit, and they, they, they did this a lot, um, and volunteers spent tens of thousands of hours doing this, and they credit, uh, they credit this use of of old media in part with helping to loosen some of that resistance. Um, an example of how new media, the, the Obama campaign used new media, one of the, the goals of the Obama campaign early on was to increase uh, African American early vote. African Americans um, uh, historically have some resistance uh, in, in part because of the legacy uh, of, um, of, uh, of uh, a, you know, of shenanigans at poll sites to uh, early voting in person. And the Obama campaign was determined to change this. Um, and and post-election um, exit polls and surveys said they were very successful at this. But uh, one of the things that they did was, cons w w was, was do a lot of voter registration. Um, and then as the early voting cycles uh, began, they were able to monitor through their, their data, wa data warehouse called Catalyst, because Catalyst was able to figure out from the Secretary of State's office exactly who had requested or who, uh, because you, you can, um, uh, w once you vote, your name is, is checked on the voter rolls, they could update that nightly so the Obama campaign could see exactly who had voted early and who hadn't, 
And uh, if, if you were one of their targeted supporters and you hadn't voted early, you would get uh, either an email or a telephone call saying, hey, maybe today's a good time to vote. If you want our help, we can send a van to help pick you up. Uh, and if you didn't vote that day, they would get the information from Catalyst and say, hey, maybe tomorrow you can, come, you can go do it. Um, so uh, uh, again, just, just a, an example of how they were, they were able to use both old media technologies and new media technologies to fulfill some of their uh, specific goals. And it's those, it's those examples and internal learning that will f has forever changed politics and campaigning. Uh, you know, I, I'm the director of what we refer to as the e-campaign division. People used to mock me because they say, well, it's the internet. Well, actually, I now think e-campaign is more apropos because it's not the internet, it's mobile and it's everything else. So um, maybe it's th that has come. But the, the, the point I wanted to make is that, you know, I oversee a division whose responsibility is to think about technology, but over the course of the last year and a half, every division within the organization became dependent on us in some way, shape, or form to begin to evolve their methodology, whether it was the finance department or the political department or the strategy department. Um, I think that at this point, when resumes come in, if it doesn't have C++ or you know Java on it, um, they, they may be a political person, but um, they're going to need to have those skill sets as well. So hybrid, um, high hybrid skills are going to be critical, I think, for any um, division moving forward. So, so far we've been focusing on the successes of digital media, but are there must also be downsides of the role that new media played in selection. We already talked about smears, whether we're talking about the idea that Obama is a Muslim or whether we're talking about Sarah Palin banning Harry Potter, both of which are, in case anyone in the room's confused, both false uh, statements uh, that circulated pretty freely. Um, this notion of unreliable information is a real one. I got an email from a, a ver multiple copies of an email from a leading intellectual media scholars about a story about Republican kids' questions about Obama. And it turned out, if you traced it back, it went to a particular church website that turned out to be a, a parody of a church website. So the, the joke for the Republic, the, the joke at the expense of Republicans was the gullibility of Republicans. The joke that I got out of it was reading the gullibility of my liberal friends who also uh, were incapable of seeing the difference between a parody and a reality. So those seem to be emblematic to me of still some issues we have as we broaden who gets to circulate media. Are there implications about the reliability and trust? And are there other issues? Uh, people are arguing new media is making us more partisan, that the blogosphere creates a more divided electorate with very little chances of the kind of purple state strategies which both Obama and McCain began the campaign cycle with to work. So what do, what do you guys see as the, the limits or the, the the challenges we face as we look at this new media scape in this election cycle. Um, yeah, I, I would say th there are definitely huge risks. I mean, it's, you know, my, my mother-in-law, uh, I will say, you know, her entire internet uh, and linear experience is uh, essentially Fox News, um, uh, uh, redstate.com, uh, Drudge Report, um, and uh, I forget this uh, uh, right-wing blogger. Like her, her world view is very informed, but clearly from a particular perspective. And it's true. I mean, you can you can operate and completely. I, I think Barack Obama said once, "Look, if I watch Fox News too, I think I'm a Muslim." You know, I mean, this, this, this <laughs> you know, this, this, this. If if that's how you're um, um, sort of. Um, consuming information, so it's possible. I think ultimately we do have to trust what I think overall did happen, which is that people diversified um, their media uh, sources and were able to get to the truth. I mean, yes, there's more misinformation out there, but there are more uh, vetted resources that if someone does take the time, you can actually find uh, uh, the correct story. I mean, in terms of, in terms of you, know, um, you know, mistakes of new media, yes, this whole idea of misinformation, but the biggest mistake is not understanding how to make that work for you. Again, Fight the Smears was powerful because he turned a huge negative into an incredible positive because, again, he gave every single supporter a way to support the campaign. With Sarah Palin, it was interesting. When she first came out, um, these rumors just instantaneously um, 
went across the internet. You know, her, her child, or in fact, you know, the, her, you know, first was revealed that her 17-year-old um, was pregnant, uh, and then that her baby that she thought, presumably it just had, was someone else's baby. Like, these rumors spread like wildfire, and unlike what um, Senator Obama did with Fight the Smears, there actually wasn't really an effective counterattack to use it as an opportunity to say, look, you know, because she's, I, I think in her case, she's played the victim role very well, and said, look, we're being attacked, we're being vilified, these, this is the campaign of, these are the supporters of Barack Obama who's supposed to be changing politics, look what he's done, and I'm just, you know, like, you, it could have been actually an incredible opportunity for the Republicans to, it's, again, change a negative into a vast um, positive. I mean, none of this stuff was inevitable. It was not inevitable that um, Obama achieved such a massive um, level of support um, amongst young people and, and winning the election. I, I think, it, again, it's, I think it's part of an overall strategy. I mean, in, in, two, in fall of 2007, you know, we did our first big event with uh, Senator Obama, then about a month later we did our first big event with Senator McCain. We partnered with MySpace, we put both of them on the channel with something called the Presidential Dialogue, where we had literally millions of, of young people watching online, on air, all simultaneously, the ability to submit questions, real-time polling, so as a candidate answered a question, the audience was responding and saying, you know what, we don't like that answer, and then that information fed back into the questioning. Re and both candidates did extremely well, and we were really excited because we thought we'd reach a threshold where we'd really be able to get both campaigns to have sort of an ongoing relationship. And we spent a lot of time with Senator Obama getting their profiles set up and all the things that they were doing on Facebook and, and YouTube, and, we, and it was somewhat painful, but we got um, Senator McCain to set up their profile. But it's amazing, from that point forward, we, vert, I mean, the Obama camp would literally, literally updating their profile constantly. New information, events coming up, new messages, new policy papers, constantly reaching out to their audience, giving tools that their audience could use. And it was like extract, you know, pulling teeth um, with the McCain campaign. So again, it's the usage of the technology. This was not inevitable. And I think um, there's just sort of a presumption that Obama is a younger guy, representative of the, the demo. It was, it was just sort of in the bag, and it, 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 it just didn't have to be that way. I, I think it's, a lot of it was just strategic uh, decision-making and lack of decision-making. I'm going to defend Republicans a little bit. Um, I, do think, I, I do think to some extent it you was. You a lot. I will, <laughs> no, just, just a little bit. I mean, I, I, I do think to some extent it wasn't inevitable, but given the choices, uh, it, was, it was fairly inevitable. I mean, they, John McCain represents a different... Uh, a, a different generation and conception of America than where most young Americans, <coughs> young Americans are. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily follow that the McCain campaign should have spent the same amount of effort on some of the stuff. But just to talk about the Palin example and defend McCain campaign a bit, McCain campaign set up a huge team of researchers and lawyers initially to try and defend Sarah Palin from uh, from uh, some uh, of the. Uh, uh, on inaccurate information that was was going about, but part part of the problem was that, um, as someone who was involved in the effort told me, a they couldn't keep track of of what everyone was saying because it was coming fast and furious. B there was enough truth in a lot of what was what they were saying that they couldn't uh, they they had a hard time convincing people that certain things were true and certain things weren't. The other thing is when you're someone like Sarah Palin and have never really been a national public figure, no matter how hard you try in this age of of, the, of of instantaneous information uh, and YouTube, you cannot you cannot competently vet someone who has not been in the public eye and expect them from from day one to have a record that you can go back and say, well, she actually never said this. Um, it's just it's it, it, it's impossible. The McCain campaign tried, um, but I, I don't think it could be done. There was just so much about her background that it would take months and months and months and dozens of researchers to figure out everything she ever said and did because again, she hadn't been in the public eye before. And I will say the fourth thing is that she didn't help matters. She exaggerated the truth at a lot of times. There were things that she told John McCain in their early conversations that turned out uh, to have uh, certain shades of nuance to them, like the fact that you know she opposed the bridge to nowhere, sort of. Um, so uh, it wasn't as if the Republicans didn't try. It's just that, uh, and this may or not may or may not be interpreted as a slap at Sarah Palin, but they really didn't have. Uh, they, they really didn't have much to work with. 
Um, <laughs> that wasn't no, the I'm actually going to no. I'm going to switch <laughs> gears completely. Um. <laughs> I mean, we, we could talk about Sarah Palin. That wasn't. The, I'm just. What I'm defending is I'm defending the fact that that it wasn't if they, it didn't occur to them that they had to quickly fight the smears. They just they tried and they couldn't. Um, <laughs> no, I really do want to switch gears. Okay. Um, Henry asked about uh, some of the negatives um, from, from the campaign, and I want to address uh, three of them. And I, I think the first, to your point, was um, resource allocation. Um, we were terribly um, under-resourced relative to the Obama campaign in just pure personnel. Um, and I'd like to sort of... I. I my lens from this is from the national committee, not the campaign, so I wasn't privy to a lot of the decisions that were made, but I'll try to armchair quarterback it a little bit. Um, you'll remember during the primaries when the campaign was essentially bankrupt, they almost turned off the lights. Um, when, when they had to start making resource decisions, I don't think the internet was the priority, when in my vantage point as a technologist, it probably should have been, because that's where you can be most efficient with little. Um, then there was also that three-month window between the time that McCain had effectively wrapped up the nomination and Obama and Clinton were duking it out. And that was precious time that I think, once again, more um, back-end work could have been done with technology to better influence the, the race. Um, I, I, can't stand, um, I can't stand squatters, but we had, to, we had to spend so much money around domain names this cycle for various reasons. Um, Fight the Smears as a standalone site um, was, was interesting. Uh, I want to give you one example of what, what happened one day uh, perusing Obama's website, and there was a promotion on the homepage for Meet Barack Obama. And just for kicks, I, I, I went and, um, I don't know, GoDaddy or somewhere, and uh, found that meetbarackobama.com was available. And, I mean, here's Meet Barack Obama promotion on his homepage staring you in the face, and they didn't acquire that domain. So we went and got it, and Henry, if you want to go there, you'll see what we developed from it. Um, <laughs> but um, it was a repository of all of our microsites um, that we developed largely to generate earned media because it was so hard to cycle to break through the media cycle that we created. Sorry, did you say dot .com or dot? Uh, dot .com. Uh, meet, meet Barack Obama. Oh, meet Barack. Sorry. Okay. Um, Sorry. But people were, you know, people are going, people are going to search engines and searching for Meet Barack Obama, thinking maybe he's going to be in their town, and they stumble across through our optimized um, site, you know, Meet Barack Obama, and not until you get to the fine print at the bottom of the page do you see that this is a product of the Republican National Committee. Um, but at its surface, it looks innocuous enough. And in fact, Barack Book looks like something one might want to click on, not knowing that it's a, a hit piece. Um, and if you go to it, you'll see that it's a um, faux uh, social network parody of Facebook, um, which our opposition research team used to send us content to basically display um, Obama's network of friends. And so you can go and click on Valerie Jarrett and find out you know, what her relationship to Obama is and who her friends are, who their friends are. So um, we created a Facebook app for this. And um, y when we updated Barack Book, your um, Facebook page would update that there was a, so you know, we, we, were, we were trying different things. But um, there are two other things I want to discuss quickly. One is um, the unprecedented amount of money that was generated online. And I, I, I by no means say this to be accusatory, but I think both parties need to take a look at how moving forward online donations are gonna be um, utilized and the security that revolves around it. Um, as an example, uh, Blue State Digital, who's responsible for Obama's uh, fundraising efforts, um, consciously chose to remove the three digit security code requirement from an online donation, which facilitated the ability for gift cards, et cetera. I mean, you could create a script that would essentially distribute um, by mass, by, by spoofing your IP address, uh, the resemblance of a donation coming domestically when it could have come from a, a, a foreign national. Um, the, and and th this is not unique to the, the left or the right. It's just, and I'm not a fan of regulation, but I do think the FEC has an obligation to start to look at technology in a more demonstrable way as to how um, campaigns are, are receiving donations online. And because I, I do think that um, Doodad Pro, just being one example, there, there were some negatives that haven't 
really surfaced yet. Um, lastly, getting back to the resources and the fact that I think there was 130 person strong team on the Obama side compared to um, four on my staff. Um, uh, <clears throat> we were getting comments from McCain supporters who were saying that they were posting comments on sites like the Washington Post and they were being removed and they couldn't figure out why. And we surmised that what was happening is that people were going to pro McCain comments on BBSs and hitting that the comment was abusive. And after enough people did it, um, those comments were removed. So there was really nothing negative or disparaging being said about the opposition. It was just using technology smartly to counter um, the, the other campaign. And, um, you know, well done, I guess. Wow. Can I say one more thing about the sure. negatives? Um, most of the, the readers, uh, and I, because I did a I did a poll, so people maybe self-responding to the poll, but um, uh, and there are there are some people in the audience who I know read the site and come and and uh, and were were, were active uh, commenters or, or people who emailed me. But most of my readers, uh, about eighty percent of them, are Barack Obama supporters, and that's dishe was disheartening to me because I wasn't writing a blog for Barack Obama supporters. Um, I was trying to write a reported blog on politics that uh, that. Um, you know, played it uh, uh, as fairly close to, to what I saw the truth as as possible, um, and giving no quarter to either campaign. Um, but when you look at the universe of of websites, um, there is a significant partisan clustering effect that goes on. Even sites that aren't partisan. I mean, the Atlantic has a series of bloggers. I would say we have two and a half bloggers that are identifiably conservative, and I'm including Andrew Sullivan as a half because he's a bit of a hybrid, but Ross Douthat, who is undeniably a wonder, brilliant, smart conservative, Megan McArdle, who is also very conservative. Um, but the majority, um, uh, two and a half out of five, so that would be roughly 50-50. Um, but the majority of people who read the site or, or, or who read all of our blogs, including Andrew's, including I should say Ross's, um, were to the left of center because people tagged the Atlantic as being part of the old media, the establishment media, the, the, the liberal media online. Um, and uh, there were very, very few sites uh, that managed, and there have been some studies done about this, but very few websites that managed to straddle both uh, left, right, and then the, you know, the small but I think fairly active group in the center who was just hungry for information. Um, and I don't know how to solve that. But I think that's a problem because I would have loved to have more Republican and conservative readers. All right, we're going to open up the questions in just a minute. So if people want to start lining up at the mics, but I'm going to ask another question to our panelists while people are beginning to formulate questions and, and get in line. So the question is about governance. We've just come through this campaign. Uh, we now are president-elect. The question is, what are our visions of how new media can be used for governance? Uh, you know, we. Are we, you know, people use the language now permanent campaign. So one notion is that the, the stuff that's gone in the campaign simply continues and that it takes on a, a different role. I've just pulled up change.gov, which is the site that the Obama people put up the very morning after uh, the election results. It's already have Office of the President-Elect uh, up, up there. Uh, so what are you seeing and what are your thoughts about what's going to happen now for both parties as we go into the next four years? If you wouldn't mind, um, I want to show you a project we created um, sure. uh, from GOP.com. Um, the platform process where the party sets basically its uh, objectives for the next four years has, has traditionally been a very offline um, process. Um, you drive to a hearing, you hope that you get to the microphone to present your thoughts to the platform committee. Uh, meetings are held regionally. And you know, so you hope you get to the microphone. You hope that they listen to what you say. You, you hope that it enters the public record. Um, and you know, maybe less than one-tenth of one percent of the nation uh, gets to participate. So um, on the platform, left hand. Oops, sorry. Just, did I hit the wrong? Yeah. Um, so for the first time in the nation's history, we wanted to change the way in which the party platform process um, evolved. And then if you scroll down and just hit. Um, 
and then maybe just click on that. Um, so we, we opened up the process for the Republican Party's 2008 platform and invited any American, regardless of party affiliation, to come in and tell us what they thought the Republican Party should, should represent the next um, four years. Um, you know, over half a million people accessed the site, uh, over 20,000 submissions, both text or, or video. Um, we've incorporated user submissions into the party platform. And I hope that, very similar to change.gov, this is the way we, we evolve. Um, no, that's okay. All right, so you want, this is what yeah, you want. Yeah, we can click on that. All right, there we go. And then just pick any topic. Okay. Um, you'll see on the right-hand column where um, Americans have, have incorporated their thoughts on, on what the party platform should be. This guy, by the way, the, the one in the middle, I don't know why he did this, but he was submitting entries all the time, but he always did it from his car at night, from his webcam. It didn't make any sense to me, but he submitted thoughts on every plank of the party platform. But, but change.gov, I think, is, is a very similar effort in, in that we got to begin to, if I can use the phrase open source government, um, whatever that means, really begin to facilitate this, this dialogue where Americans can truly contribute um, to government. Via, via the web, and both the platform project and change.gov, I think, are the, are the first um, efforts towards that. There is a trade-off between um, transparency uh, at times and efficiency that the Obama transition is working out right now. I would hope, um, just for the sake of accountability, that they are on the side of, of transparency, but it is very easy for a White House staff to say, well, we promised that all the meetings would be open, we'd say the participants, but we didn't mean this set. or we can't give you a look at what the Treasury Department, how it's actually allocating its funding, even though we said we would put all the budget online. Well, we're not going to put all the defense budget online. Obviously, there are some things you don't put online, but we're going to put, not put the entire Department of Defense. There are lots of choices that the Obama administration um, will be forced to make when it comes to uh, transparency inf inf information, which I think is going to be one of the key ways in which um, people using new media hold the administration accountable. Um, and I would just hope that they, again, err on the side of transparency uh, over efficiency because uh, when they have the power, it is going to be, they're going to be very, very, very tempted uh, to close things off, to keep deliberations private, and to back away from, from some of Obama's fairly ambitious campaign promises. Yeah, I would just say I, I totally agree with that. I think, in fact, it's probably the greatest risk that the millions of people that supported o Obama and honestly, even I think John McCain, there's just a, a different expectation of the, popul po the populace's involvement in governance. It's just we've crossed the line and, and we can't unscramble the egg, you know. Um, and I actually thought you were going to show Republican for a reason because I, I saw that oh, yesterday yeah. and I thought that was a powerful site because not only is, um, you know, obviously Obama's got change.gov and if you go to the site, He's actually asking Americans to submit their ideas, and in fact, even the night, his, the night of November 4th, in the, in the interim period before uh, he was announced as the winner, as president-elect, and before he spoke at Grant, Grant, Grant Park, there was a massive email sent out saying, thank you, this is all about you, I'm going, you know, uh, there'll be some new information um, that I'll share shortly, but he instantaneously reinforced the message that Look, you're still part of this process, but Republican. Oh, I'm sorry, it's being slow. Right, sorry. but so so clearly on the governance side, I think Obama is going to want to continue. He's got to live up to these expectations now. But I think Republican for a reason is a good site also, and hopefully it's showing from a Republican perspective that there's some rebuilding that needs to be done, or you know some leaders within the Republican part, the party think so, and so I think this is a great message as well. So it's inviting. Uh, Republicans to say, look, we just lost a huge election, but, you know, there's still core principles, you know, and it's not just from top down, but you as an individual, why don't you re-articulate, why is it that you're a Republican? What are those principles that we stand for? And again, start to invite collective intelligence to help shape the party from the bottom up. So I, th I actually think this is a great sign um, from the Republican Party that, you know, that there's an openness to listening to um, people as opposed to just, you know, waiting for five governors who are in Florida, you know, today to suddenly, you know, come out with the new, um, you know, the, the new word of what the Republican Party will be. 
I appreciate it. My nickname for the site is eathumblepie.com. <laughs> <laughs> but you can get to it at republicanforareason.com, and anybody can come in and tell us what they think the Republican Party should be doing um, to, uh, you know, cure itself. Okay, we've got some people lining up over here, so introduce yourself and ask your question. Sure, I'm Charlie Dutar. I'm in the Speech and Mobility Group here at the Media Lab. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the role in new media technologies in potentially elevating the discourse in presidential elections. Um, I've noticed that uh, most of the emails, the online videos, the sort of stuff that I saw in this election still were just tribalistic, soundbite heavy, um, lacking in nuance on any discussion on issues or policies or the actual direction government might have in a more long-term way. And can you comment on the way new media technologies, uh, is there any change, any difference? Thanks. Uh, what, was John, what was John McCain's quote each time he was asked about negative politics? What do you say? He brought Obama should have uh, accepted my town hall meeting. <laughs> right. Suggestion. Yeah, that was, that was always the excuse as to why he would then launch into these attacks. You know, I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't think uh, new media is immune to what is just politics. And when you've got folks competing when the stakes are incredibly high, and by the way, you know, negative campaigning works. I mean, there was a period of time, and again, you know, in... Uh, mid-August, you know, before the convention and then right after, before the Democratic convention, then right after the uh, Republican convention, there was a time when Obama, McCain, I think, was very effective in really going after uh, Obama's strengths, right? It was right after Obama had come back from his European trip where he had 200,000 folks in Germany, you know, loved across the world, and he was the greatest celebrity. And the McCain camp very effectively used Britney Spears and Paris Hilton and these commercials to start to bring down this guy from this mantle. It was all negative messaging, but it was effective. And then the the Ayers, the association with Bill Ayers, like that stuff started to work. And so it's it's hard, um, you know, I, I don't know if new media can solve that problem. In fact, I'm sure it can't. Um, uh, it just allows more outlets to get it out. But, you know, politics is, you know, presidential politics is tough business, you know? Uh, I don't think we can assume that it will necessarily raise the level of the discourse. I have actually, one, one example comes to mind, though, about how uh, the Obama campaign was able to use new media uh, to inject nuance in the debate. Remember the gas tax holiday that Hillary Clinton <coughs> wanted, um, and uh, the, the, uh, the which, which was, it was just, it's a gimmick. But in order, to, in order to think about the gas tax holiday as a gimmick, you actually have to think through the arguments for it because it's not, it's not um, inherently clear why getting more money back from the government would simply be a gimmick when it comes to the gas tax. Um, but uh, it, it, was, it was therefore, just as someone who likes intellectual honesty in debates, very heartwarming to read the, the primary exit polls in Indiana where half of the voters believed that the gas tax idea was a gimmick, and in fact, um, the polls were replicated across other states, and even um, at, at some points, a majority of Americans thought it was a gimmick. And the Obama campaign spent a lot of time through their new media uh, technologies and emails explaining to people why the gas tax holiday uh, was was a gimmick. Um, and you know, at least what that shows me is that you you don't necessarily have to you you don't new media technologies and distribution channels aren't just limited to very simple uh, messages that, you know, that can touch heartstrings or whatever. You can actually make intellectual arguments. Um, and it was good to see that. I mean, there weren't too many examples of that because it's much easier and, and presumably more effective to, um, you know, I mean, I think one of the, you know, the Republican National Committee, I think, made a, a very, very funny video about, uh, about Obama's celebrity. <laughs> Um, I forgot what I forgot what it was called, but it was it was very humorous, at least in my opinion. It's, it's easier to go to this simple, to the non-nuanced, but at times, or at least at one time, it was used effectively to go toward the nuance. So, you know, I think if everyone tries, maybe. I actually think new media exacerbates the problem of negative campaigning, and um, whether it's the campaign controlling it or not. The fact that the community at large can now play a part in it um, in a, such a decentralized way where the campaign has no influence over it, um, it, it, it just make, makes it all the more um, worse. Uh, two things, well, I guess it, in that vein, um, 
uh, Reverend, Reverend Wright's name was off limits. Um, Senator McCain said, just, you know, no way, it's not coming up, and it never did from the campaign. But you, you, you found it everywhere in the blogosphere, um, and the campaign distanced itself from that, and when those comments were posted on the bulletin boards, you know, they were, they were removed. It, it, it was just a taboo subject. But one interesting, I, one interesting thing I saw during the campaign was um, my um, friend's Facebook profiles, all, a majority of them started to have um, middle names. And um, I started to see, um, you know, Joe Hussein Smith on Facebook. And I'd, I'd click on it. I've got, I, I've got a vast group of Facebook friends. I don't know a, a, a lot of them. But so I, I'd, 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 click on, I'd click on it, and I'd say, all right, this is a Republican trying to be cute, when in fact it was Democrats who were just mocking the fact that Obama's middle name was being mocked, and I'd, I'd love to know from Facebook how many people actually had Hussein there in their name. I mean, there are a it, lot. it must have been in the millions, but it was just an interesting use of it. was like a cool thing for Democrats to do on Facebook, but it spread viral. Yeah. It, spread yeah, it was yeah. pretty wild to watch. We had at the Center for Future Civic Media yesterday a speaker who's been scanning the blogosphere for key words and found that there were overwhelmingly more references to Hussein on liberal blogs than on conservative blogs. Uh, uh, so that, in fact, liberals spent more time responding to that that criticism or that tactic, then the tactic itself was played out. Over here. Hi. Well, I'm Goss. I'm from North, uh, student Northeastern, actually, and a couple of my friends that have a Hussein middle name on their <laughs> Facebook in the <laughs> past couple of weeks. And what I'm wondering is, or I saw, I'm not too sure what this was, but I think I read that the Obama campaign or the Obama administration might be using a website of its own to as a channel of information going directly to the public, which would bypass any kind of media outlet. And how, so that's, if you have any thoughts on that, and how do you think the new administration might use new media in just governing in general? Well, they've said several things, one of which is they're going to, um, Obama wants to uh, incorporate a daily, a, a weekly YouTube address as opposed to a, you know, a weekly radio address, radio, radio being the traditional format for it. Um, the White House will probably establish some sort of a blog. Co whether that will include comments is, is TBD, because there's a lot of stuff you have to think through. Um, the Obama, one of the things that he has said he would do is, uh, and, and again, this will come at the expense of the efficiency of these, but he wants to open uh, all regulatory hearings, put them on a, a centralized website, and allow people to comment on regulatory hearings in real time, and force the people who are administering the regulations to read all the comments. Again. Uh, there's a difference between the, the efficiency and transparency. You can see how that, you know, the, the, the trade-off there. Um, uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the other things that they're considering is in, in something that uh, the, uh, the uh, government of the UK has already instituted, which is sort of a, I think it's petitions.uk.gov, where citizens can um, launch their own petition drives that, in theory, someone at 10 Downing Street uh, will read every single petition. They can be either jocular or they can be serious. Um, you haven't heard too much about it uh, in the UK, in part because they haven't quite figured out or they're, they're not quite prepared to accept the ramifications of allowing a citizen petition process. But I know that is something uh, the Obama folks are uh, are considering as well. Whether they do any of this, I'm you know I'm not sure. But but he talked about some of this uh, in in, uh, in during the campaign, and, and and I do know that that they're thinking about these things right now. And uh, you know, one of the one of the things we're hearing, and I think it would be just tremendous, is that uh, they're considering creating a chief technology officer cabinet level position. That's which a definite. They're definitely going to do that. Yeah, and yeah. so you know that I think is transformative. And I think they were talking to Eric Schmidt of Google, to, and I guess he's publicly denied, but maybe he, he moaned. Who knows? But the president-elect calls you and says, you know, I'd like you to help. It's hard yeah, to say no. it's hard to say no. So. Um, um, that I think would be extraordinary because it would it would essentially, you know, make every area of government um, put under the microscope of how can technology be utilized to make it more efficient, right? So if, whether it's education, healthcare, all these different ideas make technology at the center. And I think I'm really hoping that that's actually a, um, a big sort of single huge message that you know because the cabinet you know historically. You know that's where the that's where the heavy hitters are. That's who has access to the president and a and a CTO who has accountability across all of these different divisions. I think really would be huge. Okay, Kevin.
No. <laughs> we'll repeat the question if. both in terms of campaigning and governance. But I also hear that the data seems to be linking the use of these technologies with just younger people. So we say like there's a, this big turnout from young people, and we associate it with these new technologies. If they are trans transferring into the governance, what are we going to do in order to bring other people who are not included in that young demographic? Like in what way can using new media technologies and governance encourage adoption among older people, among people who are often kind of kept out maybe because the web is inaccessible to people with certain disabilities or for other reasons they are just not really included in the conversation. Are we further alienating big portions of the citizenship and just shifting from one group to another by doing this? So to repeat the question for the podcast audience and others, the question had to do with we've sort of had a lot of discussion around new media and young voters. What are, if we move toward new media, what are the implications for older voters who often have lagged behind in their embrace of new technologies? Is that? And it's, also, <laughs> and it's also a geographic split as well. I mean, it's a geographic split. Urban areas tend to be more wired to wireless than rural areas. Both candidates, well, it doesn't matter what John McCain promised now, because he's not, Obama. Um, but McCain is, right, is big. He is big at, right, it's, he's big at, uh, right, he's telecommunications. They both promised significant expansions, uh, significant um, expenditures uh, on um, broadband, ser broadband services for rural areas. But there's, there has to be a revolution in uh, technology. Po and I, I confess I'm not an expert here, and there are probably people in the audience who know much more about it than I do, but there has to be an enormous regulatory revolution in technology policy uh, in order for there to be truly universal broadband in this country and have it or not. So I think part of it is, um, I think part of, part of that's the obstacle but it does seem to be something that this administration is aware of. I don't know if that's probably not a good enough answer for you. Um, and it is a problem, certainly. But, um, I, you know, the, I think uh, I'm, I'm not confident that, well, maybe I am confident, but it just, th th this is still an area where, again, where, where technology companies and tele telecoms spend enormous amounts to lobby. And there's the, every couple of years in Congress, there are these extremely complicated uh, telecom bills that push things in one direction or another, um, and I guess it'll just take some something to dislodge that in order for us to get to the point where, where again, we could truly have some sort of a, a universal broadband network across the country, which I do think is kind of the only way to facilitate access for everyone. Well, can I just follow up with a question a little bit Just to say that it's not necessarily a technical question that I'm interested in, but actually right. about the people. So like in digital TV transition, the, adver the advertisements often uh, indicated that older people, there was a fear that they wouldn't even know how to change to a digital TV. So how can we expect them to participate in like a YouTube address? Yeah, no, I, 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 there's a, Harry Shearer has is a wonderful radio show where he has a segment where he regularly um, pokes holes in the idea that this digital transition is going to be smooth. The one in, in uh, you know, in February when analog television no longer works. Um, and the government will say, well, we spent a lot of money trying to educate people, but if you look at the response rates of people who we know have analog TV sets or actually sending in for coupons to buy digital, digital conversion boxes, uh, it's, it's fairly low. So um, I, don't, I don't have any answers. I just I agree that it's going to be a problem. Yeah, you know, um, Circle, which is the group that um, <clears throat> uh, measures youth voting, just released um, the fact that in this 2008 election, the number of 18 to 29-year-olds that voted for the first time in at least two decades was greater than the number of people 65 and over. And it may actually be the greatest number ever, but they're, they're looking at, um, um, they're looking at um, year, years prior to two decades. But, you know, you're, you're right. I mean, in some ways it's similar to the challenge of when we had all sorts of conversations about the digital divide. You know, you had whole groups of low-income communities that were not part of the process, and so how could we expect them to engage? And this is why I think, for me, it comes back to a CTO type position or getting, you know, 100% broadband penetration. We actually need a presidential team that recognizes the importance of enabling technologies for everyone, not just for, you know, those that can, you know, afford broadband. But I think it does come down to that. But you're right. I mean, you know, young people, again, partly because of the new technologies, part of the campaign, part of the strategy, 
they are utilizing and taking advantage of all this stuff in much bigger numbers than older folk, and we can only hope that this administration recognizes that it's not good to leave now that segment behind where, you know, we've left other segments behind to, you know, to ill effect as well. From a legislative standpoint, I keep my eye on Democrat Senator-elect Mark Warner, um, who really is a high-tech exec who got into politics and, uh, and really believes strongly about these issues. Um, <coughs> so this, this would be interesting to, to watch over the coming years. From a, whoa, um, fr from a sociological standpoint, there's actually a really large audience of older web users, but where they're falling behind technologically is um, in the advancement of, you know, 2.0 and, um, I mean, look at eons, which is nowhere on the map from a network standpoint relative, you know, to Facebook. But this was a point I, I, I made at the outset of the campaign, which was we're so enamored now with the chic sites, Twitter, et cetera, that we've forgotten about the millions of users that are on the portals, AOL, um, MSN, Yahoo, even. And um, from my experience there, you know, they're in the older users are there in droves, but they're not where you'd think they are. They're on the gaming sites, which on face value seems contradictory, but they're playing backgammon and cribbage on MSN games. And, um, Trying to find Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, I guess. Um, but it's, I think it's just the adoption of the evolution of technology. Um, but I, I'd argue that there's actually a pretty sizable older audience online. Great. Over here. Um, hello, I'm Madeline Ellis. I'm a graduate student here at CMS. Um, my question, forgive me if it's a little cynical. Uh, that often seems to be my role here. But um, we've been talking a lot about user, act, active users, engaged users. Um, and I'm just wondering if we really are to take what has happened as a universally rosy picture or if more, it, on the surface, it seems like users are driving the conversation, but there really is a lot of thought taken to manipulating the conversation from the campaigns and from media outlets. Um, and sort of as, as insiders, if you could Give us your view on, on that negotiation that's happening. What, what would be an example, do you think, of manipulation that you've seen? Um, I don't know if I can think of anything at, at the exact moment, but give me, give me a minute. I don't know. <laughs> if my question is uh, vague, forgive me. McCain campaign, I mean, the, McCain, uh, the gentleman mentioned Joe the plumber. The McCain campaign attempted to make Joe the plumber sort of a universal stand-in for every man. There was a web campaign, you know, show us how you're Joe the plumber, member of the commercial, I'm Joe the plumber, I'm Joe the plumber, I'm Joe the plumber. Um, there was certainly a lot of attention paid to Joe the plumber, um, but, uh, and, and the McCain campaign did its best to drive that, and the media paid a lot of attention to it. Uh, and the American people didn't seem to. So um, it might be an example of how the media, I, I, I acknowledge, I mean, this again was this because both candidates incidentally mentioned the guy's name, what, 40 times total in the debate. In some sense, the story led the media to say, who, who is this Joe the Plumber guy? Um, but the effect that Joe the Plumber had in the election, unfortunately for the McCain campaign, uh, was, was fairly minimal. So maybe there's an example of how um, in this fragmented age, the media can try to set an agenda or collectively not try because there's no, I can tell, well, if there is a conference call, <laughs> I am not on it and I want to be on it because, you know, I work in these areas. But, um, you know, just the collective uh, mentality of the media certainly focused on Joe the plumber and then on, you know, the fact that he wasn't a license and all this stuff didn't, didn't seem to matter that much. But maybe one example of, of how the media did, did, the old media did matter was in, in helping people, or helping people come to a different perception of Sarah Palin than they had initially. Um, you know, the, the succession of interviews that she did, I mean, I, again, I'm a consultant for CBS News, but the way that CBS News uh, extended, Katie Couric had about 45 minutes with Sarah Palin uh, over the course of two days, and CBS broke the interview into three or four minute chunks and ran it over a week, and it did seem like every single day there was an additional question. Now, all the questions, I should say, uh, I think are entirely defensible from the standpoint of asking them, but 
every day it seemed to be a more outrageous question that she didn't that she didn't get. Um, and I have heard the argument that that was CBS trying to manipulate people's impression of Sarah Palin. I disagree with that, but that might be something you know what you're something to the degree of what your what your discussion. There are people within campaigns who go on and pretend that they're users in order to drive the conversation. Or um, we actually referenced once um, uh, people taking down comments um, and enabling people to cancel out comments. I guess sort of. I think that stuff happens on, on the on the extreme margins. Not that people are extreme, but just it happens on the real margins of of the. I mean, the people. I guess the sock pocket, sock puppets is the. A technical phrase for them, and I, I, I mean that always. There's some, you know, usually just individual dumb person on a campaign thinks they can be cute by pretending to do X, Y, and Z, um, and because it's so, it's people are fairly easily exposed. It, these things are fairly easily exposed. So I don't, I don't think that that was much of a. Well, let me, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, one of the most heavily hit visited Wikipedia entries of all time was Sarah Palin's entry, the day of her announcement. And if you follow the history page back. It looked like between 60 to 70 percent of the content there was written between midnight and noon, the day of the announcement. Wow. Right. Well, let's say we don't know who wrote that, but circumstantial probably evidence the... suggests it was probably someone in the campaign. Now, whether we see that as manipulation or simply that's good. Uh, I would see move, that as good campaigning, um, but some could see it as I could see what you're saying. I mean, you obviously you you want to try and define Sarah Palin positively if you're the McCain campaign, and if you don't do that, you know. It's a hard question. It's a hard question because I, I mean, I just see um, a political campaign is essentially a manipulation of media. You know, it's uh, it's so it, I, I'm a little hard pressed to answer because you know the campaigns are trying to tell a story, and they're going to create you know very effective ways to manipulate all the different ways you're going to hear that story. You know, on all the different platforms. Um, so yeah, I, th I think, so to the, your question, I think yes. I think it is very much complete manipulation of media to tell your story. I, you know, that's, that's, I mean, that's the deal. I mean, that's, that's, you gotta win an election. Um. This is all the story, just very briefly. Martin Eisen, this, this, this uh, the, the, there actually is an example now, this uh, guy named, or a fake guy, he's not, doesn't exist, but um, this uh, person, uh, or a few people created an identity for a guy named Martin Eisenstadt, who they claimed was a McCain advisor, who had fed Carl uh, Cameron of Fox the quote that uh, that you know Sarah Palin couldn't uh, distinguish between a uh, couldn't didn't know whether Africa was a or thought Africa was a country as opposed to a uh, continent, and a lot of uh, media sources uncritically picked this up and said, oh, you know, this is the McCain. They didn't even bother to check that this person. The McCain campaign really had no idea who this person was, was an advisor. But again, these things get exposed so quickly. Right. Well, I think probably what's interesting about that example is because the original quote came from a, report, a reporter on Fox that was critical of Sarah Palin, you instantaneously believed it was true, right? Because right. Fox has such a reputation right. of only reporting positive news that it's like, well, who, who needs to check? There's no right. way Fox if, would. If Keith Olbermann <laughs> said something bad about Barack Obama, you'd be like, you know. It must it has be, true. To be true, right? It has to be true. So, anyway, so I mean, there are so so to that degree, if, if that if that's what falls in the category of manipulation of media, no doubt. What em, what Keith Olbermann does <laughs> every night um, at eight o'clock, and what Sean Hannity does at uh, nine p.m. every night, that is complete um, bias on both sides of the aisle. Technologically, we're facilitating this through tools like mashup technology. I mean, you can now mash up mashups and mash those up. And so what begins as a pure campaign originated video takes on a life of its own um, by the very fact you put it on YouTube. So the, the manipulation, uh, we're facilitating it, I guess. Yeah. Next question over here. Hi, my name's uh, Whitney Trittine. I'm also a CMS graduate student. Um, I'm going to add another facet to Madeline's uh, kind of uh, cynicism. I come from a, a background in very traditional activism and have a lot of uh, old school hippie friends from the 60s who uh, are very disturbed by what they're seeing uh, with Barack Obama. And I keep hearing the, uh, the phrase cult of personality, things like this. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't believe it, but this is what I'm hearing from my older friends. And uh, at the same time, 
Uh, I, they're criti you know, criticizing the kind of things that you're pointing out here where it's like you just put a widget on your blog and you feel like you've done something that's active and involved in changing policy. And I'm wondering what you have to say about that, first of all. And uh, second of all, um, I'm wondering what you have to say about this also from the, the point of view that uh, the very same people who have been saying about Bush for the last eight years that, you know, he's someone that I want to go have a beer with and, you know, he's just like us are now saying the same things about Barack Obama where it's like, you know, he's a scholar, he's one of us, we feel very, we feel very comfortable with him. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing to be believing about your candidates. In fact, I think it's a great thing that people are feeling connected with their candidates. But at the same time, I'm wondering if the kind of tools that we've been talking about have changed how we approach our politics rather from a, instead of from a policy perspective, we're coming at it now from a kind of like, who's, who's, our, who's our man kind of, or mm. woman uh, perspective. Uh, I, I think I think it is. I think it is. Although I would love to ask what what you call your hippie friends if um, if if they had if they felt a certain um, reverence for John F. Kennedy during the '60s. If he was became this larger than life mythical figure who represented so much, and then we had Watergate and all these. You know. So I I, I would I would I would uh, be curious um, how they would compare their personal feelings for him to what's happening with Obama now. But I, I do think there's, I mean, we live in a celebrity culture, a lot of it fueled by MTV, um, uh, where, you know, there is this, uh, this idea that we can be, you know, I can have a hundred, you know, 300 friends instantaneously. Yeah, you know, I, I can create these intimate relationships. So you're right, there is a different, um, I don't know if it's necessarily bad. I mean, I do think for our audience, I do think that you know that they there is a certain kind of kinship with Obama, but there's no doubt that issues played a big role. I mean, 74 percent of 18 to 29 year olds told us that they personally know someone that fought in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, you know, a, a huge issue in terms of seeing your friends, independent of how you felt felt about the war, but knowing that who is president. Has a day, has a real impact on your lives, and so when our audience is telling us they're seeing their friends come home and not getting the treatment they deserve, or not getting their school benefits, or they can't hold a job, or they can't stay in a relationship, that became a very real issue for them. And seeing gas prices and knowing that we're at war because of our, you know, dependence on oil. So, so while there certainly is a, I think there is a cult of personality. I don't think that completely trumped issues like a massive deficit you know, stock markets plunging, fears on, on global warming. So, you know, we, we have to give some credit to, you know, that this will also was an issues-based election. Could I, could I also ask then to follow up with that, how deeply do you think uh, the people that you were working with were engaged with issues? Because, um, you know, Barack Obama has prom promised to increase military spending and, you know, in various issues, this is, the people who I'm working with are saying there's a disconnect between this ideal of him as a strong anti-war candidate, and I share those people's concerns, but what he's promising on the policy side, and I'm, that's that's the kind of disconnect I'm curious about. Right. I'll point out, he has always said, he has always um, denied that he's an anti-war candidate. Right. What he will say is, I'm against the Iraq War. I'm not against war. Right. Um, uh, and um, and incidentally, actually, both and at this point now, he's he's he he's talking about cutting defense spending. But that's because everyone's talking about cutting defense spending. But that's a tangential point. But I I just I just wanted to clear that up because maybe P, I think part of the the genius of the Obama campaign was that he allowed a lot of different things to be projected onto him. And maybe that also, you know, could turn out to be, if he doesn't do very well, his undoing. Because expectations for him may be very, very different, uh, maybe not in the reality. I think in terms of increasing, increasing, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm on here. Increasing activism has improved through technology because we're we're making it easier and important. I think most important geographically um, because if you're from a small town, you can convene with a close knit group of people. But we've broadened that ability. As an example, at le you know at least on our social network, and Obama had the same functionalities. You can really get into the minutia of how you want to become an activist by, you know, I care about these issues, this is how I'm willing to help support these issues, whether it's door knocking or phone banking, et cetera. And I just think that's increasing the body of people that want to participate, which, which is a, a good thing. Um, you, you've opened a huge door for me that I'm not sure I want to go into on um, criticizing Obama. But I think the one point 
uh, the, the one point that we were trying to make this campaign that I'm not really sure ever resonated was that we don't know a lot about Senator Obama. And I, I mean, I hope he's a great president. I, I, I hope America becomes stronger and we solve our economic issues. But we really know so little about him um, that time, time, time will tell um, about, his tr about his true self. I feel like we know a lot. We just don't. It's just not that what we see the image of. Because I feel like all that information's out there. It's just that people aren't connecting with it. They're connecting with other elements. But I don't want to take up too much more. All right, yeah, so we are, we're about to go into what I call the lightning round session. <laughs> We've got 15 <laughs> minutes late. We have a hard stop at the top of the hour. So everyone can try for conciseness on both sides of the microphones. Here we can hopefully get at least these people waiting in line. Yeah, um, I'll try to pack this all into a, to a quick soundbite, but... My name is Ev Boyle, and I, I helped start, and I've been working on research for a site called glassbooth.org uh, for the past year. Some of you guys might have seen it, but it's a nonpartisan, not profit, not for profit voter education site where we really tried to get all of the candidates and their positions on not just mainstream issues like Iraq and abortion, but also different issues like net neutrality or media consolidation or sort of the principle of war as an instrument of policy, different types of questions, and really making that information transparent. So. My question is about the debates, um, and with the debates this year, you saw them start to open up in the sense they had the CNN YouTube debate. There was the thing on MTV where there was um, citizens submitting questions, but they didn't really go all the way. There was still a control maintained over the questions, and because of that, you never really got questions asked in the public sphere about questions like media consolidation or drug policy or these sort of marginalized issues. So uh, I'm just wondering, I guess, how you think the control over the debates is changing and, and how much longer you think sort of corporations and also the two major parties can keep that control and how soon they're going to have to sort of let citizens really choose the questions that are asked. Um, well, I, I get paychecks from corporations, so I'm, I'm, was, you can disbelieve this response, of course, but um, I spent a lot of time on the campaign trail and in virtually every college town that both candidates were asked, they were always asked at least one question about drug policy. Um, and it happened in 2004 uh, when all the candidates, I mean, is, so the question was certainly asked and the candidates um, had stock responses to it because the questions were, were usually, you know, were, were usually similar. Um, um, and they, they, they took positions on things like net neutrality. Um, uh, and, they, and I, you know, you would hear them ask about media consolidation, but you're right. I mean, I don't, I don't think you're ever going to uh, convince the uh, old media to the extent that they, they have control over these settings to completely relinquish it. Um, uh, I mean, Ralph Nader has certainly been trying for years and years and years by trying to get into these debates. I mean, I, I, do, I do think the Commission on Presidential Debates, probably for different reasons than you do, but I think it's a complete and utter joke. Uh, and that, you know, that the candidates, um, I mean, that, that it's, a, it's a private corporation that essentially has, uh, I mean, and that, that does actually create concerns for me, a private corporation having control over these very, very, very important moments of, uh, of, our, um, of our democracy. So I think you and I may disagree about corporate media uh, for a variety of on different levels, but I think perhaps we can, we can both agree that um, the Commission on Presidential Debates is, is one thing uh, that, that that and this, for a lot of complex reasons, why I, I think it's an, an awful idea. But um, it, it is it is a bit disconcerting to have a private corporation control uh, what are the uh, just even the, the format and the rules. So the candidates uh, say that they negotiate them. It's it's a don't get me, I'm not, I'm not going to talk more about this because it's a very sore issue for for me. But <laughs> they are kind of ridiculous. I hope they go away. Well, I just want to echo Mark's sentiments and say that that, for me, was the most disappointing part of this entire campaign cycle, was that the Presidential Commission on Debates did such a poor job of incorporating technology and bringing in the voices yeah. of the citizens to participate in something that was archaic um, uh, on its face. I mean, it, this is a call out, look at the camera, this is a call out to whoever leads that organization to please, in the next set of debates, um, improve. Yeah, when, when, we, when we did our first uh, um, big event with Senator Obama on MTV MySpace, we, we partnered. And by the way, Glass Booth is a great website, and I wish we had done more work with you. Um, uh, when we did our first MTV MySpace presidential dialogue with Senator Obama, we partnered with a group called 10questions.com. And the basic idea with, with 10 questions was that people submitted 
the question that they wanted to ask the president and, or, the, wow, uh, they wanted to ask the candidate. Um, and we said, look, at, uh, at 10.30 on the morning that we were doing the dialogue, which was happening at 12 o'clock, the number one question at 10.30 would be the question that was asked, um, and it turned out to be on net neutrality. Yeah, I, that's, we, that's where we got Obama's position, actually, was from you guys, so yeah. there was some good stuff there. Okay, next. Oh, am I next? Yep. Hello? Mm. Sorry. So I've never worked with a mic before. Hey, okay, so uh, what do you think about um, Barack's not having any kind of military experience? I mean, certainly he's not qualified to, um, what, be the president if he doesn't have any military experience. Okay, uh, not exactly a media question. I don't know if anyone wants to try to respond to it, but. Oh, well, you know, the election went on and um, I thought we were talking about the election and media results. Right, well. Well, I well, think you know, the I mean, there, there are a lot of people that, so can, we, people can we talk about the, the role of the media in representing this question of experience, which was certainly a central theme running through the campaign? Well, especially when compared to someone who had the incredible background of John McCain. I mean, it was a, it was a big differentiating characteristic that I don't think, um, you know, I think John McCain didn't do a good enough job of, of, of drawing that distinction. Um, but I think what Obama was able to do. Okay, so you think that McCain didn't have um, military experience and that for it wounded him in his campaign, but because Obama um, kind of um, could do battle or something, um, that made him equal to McCain? I mean, I don't know how far we want to go or down this road, than but McCain, perhaps. right. I mean, my, my sense is in this on this particular issue, if the Iraq War, if the Iraq War had remained as big an issue um, as it was a year ago, um, the sort of preponderance on military background and military acumen probably would have made much more of a difference. Ultimately, the campaign became much more about the ability to be, a, you know, a steward over the economy. And I think on that front, McCain didn't, you know, the military experience, the hero, the heroism, all that stuff just became much less important. And um, so I think it just became a non-issue, even though McCain certainly had, you know, much more uh, cred in that area. Okay, well, I've got eight minutes to get two questions in, so why don't we, if you'd let us go to the next questioner. So, are you? Okay, you're not, you're not in line for a question? All right, uh, over here. Uh, I'm curious in your opinion, why did media so completely dropped the issue of Obama producing his birth certificate since the two most important qualifiers for presidency is age and the place of birth. Is that, do you think the only reason it was they completely Wait. never dropped dropped it completely because he was black and they were afru, uh, afraid of being accused? Well, you're Wait, well, you're saying he you're saying born, he, he, yeah, the story that he wasn't well, he born in Hawaii. He still has not produced a birth certificate to this day. We still don't know if he's an American or not. We should go to fightthesmears.com yeah, no, and it's, it's and see, see if it's there. Seriously, yeah. I mean that that's definitely been a rumor that he wasn't born in the United States, and in fact. The but wouldn't it be easily uh, resolved by producing a birth certificate? Well, like he, any one of us well, when we go he, to get a the, tr license? the truth of the matter is I think he has, he has. but that has, the truth has nothing to do with <laughs> this, right? Um, and because and in fact, when, when he quote unquote suspended his campaign in a much more elegant style than McCain suspended his campaign, but when he went back to Hawaii for, um, to visit his sick grandmother, there was, the rumor was that was all a cover you know, for him to go back and burn documents that actually really... Oh, there it is. There it is. And if it's on the internet, it's gotta be true. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks fake to me. <laughs> that's, again, that's the power of what this campaign has done. But here's what, do you believe that? Do you think that's a valid, having seen that, because it's, what would it take to convince you? No, I'm serious, because obviously the Obama campaign is putting this out. You could say, well, this is their fabrication. But, but, but one question in this age of all this stuff is, you know, what type of authority does it take to convince people, even though there does seem to, you know, you, you can never approach 100% of the, of the, so. But I mean, maybe it's, a, it's an unanswerable question. Yeah, I mean. David, David is just noting that at probably no other point in human history right. could we have answered this question or rumor right. as quickly as mm -hmm. we've done here. Whether we believe or trust right. the information on the web would, yeah. or not is a legitimate question. And but actually, 
the information on both sides is readily available at a fingertip. And uh, scro just scroll time. up, just scroll up. See, what the, look what the directive says at the top. Next time someone talks about Barack's birth certificate, make sure they see this page. It's amazing. It is. Okay. Uh, do you guys have final comments? Anything we haven't talked on that you think is central to our understanding of this topic? Wow. Nice. So, yeah, the, the question is fundraising in the new media. What are We talked in a little bit, but uh, clearly it's one of the big implications of this campaign. Is One of the big transformations is how much money, how it's possible to process smaller scale donors, and what the, some of the implications of that may be. The truth is, I, I'm I'm really excited by it. This this whole idea of actually take it out of the political context for a second. Um, this idea of micro philanthropy, it's really you know there are there are it, it presents enormous opportunity. If you look at websites like uh, Kiva.org, some of you might be familiar with Kiva or Global Giving. Um, these are sites that essentially allow. Um, an individual to make a personal connection to another individu individual. Uh, in the case of Kiva.org, it is an entrepreneur in a developing country that might need a, a micro loan of $250, but you know, in their home country, that that is an enormous amount of money that then allows them to launch a, a thriving business that can transform their family. Um, and so much as uh, from what has been learned. Um, from Senator Obama's campaign is how to facilitate these kinds of connections where you essentially eliminate intermediaries. And, and another thing that's been really amazing about Kiva is that you know the, the, the payback rate is something extraordinary, like 98% of the loans that are made are, are paid back, which is amazing. But not only that, when the founders of Kiva launched, they thought they would just be helping the entrepreneurs who now got access to capital. But they've discovered that they've created a community amongst the people who are loaning the money who are now saying, wow, you know, I put money into this business in Peru, but do you know that there's an, an entrepreneur in Uruguay who's got a similar kind of business? So I, I think, you know, outside of the political context, I think there are enormous opportunities in education. You know, we're working with, with the Gates Foundation on an idea now to facilitate, you know, the idea of creating a scholarship marketplace where any individual can make a, a donation in the form of a scholarship to a young person. Um, Who's, who's at risk of dropping out of high school. It's, it's, it's tremendous, I think, um, what it could mean for solving really intractable problems by tapping into the goodwill of individuals all across the world. I'd just like to reiterate what I said earlier about the importance of being as forthright as possible about your donors and the ease in which the Obama campaign enabled um, small dollar donations. I think it's great that as many Americans donated, presumably Americans donated as they did, but um, I, I think it's presumably. presumably. I think it's incumbent. Um, I think it's incumbent that moving forward. I mean, there was there was no transparency on Obama's website as to their donors. The RNC. The RNC provided a database where you could search for any donor. Um, Ron Paul provided the names of all of his donors, as did Mike Huckabee on, on, his web, on their websites. Um, so, and the response from the Obama campaign that it, it was going to be too difficult to sift through the donors to determine who was valid and who wasn't, when in fact Visa processes millions of more donations per hour than the Obama campaign did in their entire campaign. And the, 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 the response at, 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 at its surface um, wasn't acceptable to me. Um, and maybe I'll end by, by acknowledging that the McCain campaign was more transparent about that and some of the Obama campaign's responses uh, were, uh, were silly and that Barack Obama, and this may be getting to what, what you want to talk about, and that Barack Obama um, uh, you know, did decide to opt out of the public financing system um, because he simply believed that he could um, raise a lot more money uh, and, and did, in his mind, justify for the fact that saying, well, if I can get two million people to give, that's kind of public financing. It's not a bunch of people, but uh, not not a you know not a smaller group of, of folks. Um, but Obama has also promised to support a bill that would mandate public financing for presidential elections. Kind of easy to do that once you've been elected, but he's promised to do that, um, and and he obviously was successful not doing that. So it'll be very interesting to see whether he keeps that promise or whether he uh, w or whether he tries to um, wiggle out of it. Now I'm going to get a little hyper-partisan because um, you brought that up. 
Obama did promise that he, that he was going to take financing, and then when he saw the potential of the internet and how much money was coming in, he he, he, he backed I off agree. of his word. And now that he's elected, pr is promising to change it to. Uh, so it's it's hypocritical. Oh well, it's 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 something. But he you know he he did. I mean he de he saw. I mean the, even if even Obama partisans should acknowledge that the decision to opt it was a wonderful instrumental and, and tactical moment for his campaign, uh, but ethic, or not, I wouldn't say ethically, but it, it wasn't the best moment when it comes to, um, you know, sort of the, uh, keeping his camp, keeping his promises. So. so it's clear the debates about this campaign will continue for a long time to come, uh, but this has been an illuminating discussion, and I appreciate all of the panelists and the audience participation. So thanks everyone for a great event.